Okay, hello everyone. I don't know if it's afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Jimzewski. I'm a professor at UCLA, and I actually specialize in things to do with quantum mechanics. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Lilac, who's actually a grad student in my group. And he is working with uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. We do this thing called atomically precise manufacturing uh, that uses quantum mechanics. And he's going to be uh, given a workshop today, which is called uh, Diffraction and Wave Particle Duality and image te Imaging Techniques. So uh, imaging techniques that sort of use quantum type phenomena. Um, and I think hopefully most people will be able to understand it and there will be some Q&A at the end. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Sam Eilach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, and hello, everyone. Uh, I look very much forward to giving you this talk today. Uh, can everyone see the screen right now? Yes, hopefully. All right. Well, so I'm going to be talking to you about imaging techniques and an introduction to scale and limits of resolution, as Jim had mentioned. And so just sort of a brief overview, uh, we're going to introduce perspectives first. We're going to talk about uh, scale, waves, and wave-particle duality, a quantum phenomena. Uh, we're going to understand how detectors are used, how we can use our eyes for optical microscopes, and how we need to rely on other phenomena for uh, things such as uv vis spectroscopy. And then we're going to discuss how we can go beyond the limits of optical resolution and increase it, and uh, that'll be introducing topics such as electron microscopy and diffraction techniques. And then we're going to go all the way down to atomic imaging using scanning probe microscopy techniques. Uh, and this is a, a representative AFM image of something like that. This is the first ever Martian particle that was imaged from the Mars rover on the Phoenix mission. And if you find these topics interesting, there are some very simple workshops you can do to visualize these phenomena. Uh, you can do imaging of your surroundings just using simple things such as a USB microscope. Uh, you can very easily visualize the wave interactions that we're going to be discussing using just a laser pointer and a DVD fragment. And you can use that same DVD fragment to build a spectrometer of paper. And then you can also do sort of a generalized scanning probes on paper workshop if you want to get an idea of how scanning probe microscopy works. And the material list is pretty small. You would just need a generic USB microscope, a green laser pointer. Red could work. It's a bit dimmer. Uh, paper craft spectrometer or a Lego one, uh, DVD fragments, and then a pen, pencil, marker, and perforated paper. So when we talk about very small things down to the nano scale, we need to understand that size really matters. And we use what's called the logarithmic scale to help represent these very small and large things using powers of 10. And you may be familiar with this scale uh, through things such as the Richter scale or the pH scale for acidity and basicity. And if you live in California, uh, like many of us do, you may have experienced minor to light earthquakes in the realm of three to four magnitude. And it's kind of curious how going from that mild inconvenience where the ground can sort of shake a little agitatingly and maybe knock some stuff off of tables, and yet if you go to a uh, magnitude 7 earthquake, you can end up with buildings collapsing at the epicenter, massive fatalities and injuries that tend to occur. And it's very curious how going up just three numbers can have such a drastic impact on that uh, earthquake's magnitude and damage that it does. And so what's happening here is we're using powers of 10 to represent this. If we go from scale two or magnitude two to magnitude three, we're talking about a tenfold increase in the magnitude of that earthquake. So that light earthquake you feel around magnitude four is a thousand times weaker than the catastrophic magnitude seven earthquakes that have just destroyed stuff throughout history. And you can sort of see that more representatively in this graphic here, how it just exponentially is increasing or logarithmically would be more appropriate to say increasing as you go up by a power of 10 each time corresponding to a magnitude. And if this topic seems confusing, even by the end of this talk, there's a really great old video called The Powers of 10 that I strongly recommend you watch. Uh, it's a really great video that puts this all into perspective. 
And so we're going to be talking about very, very small things uh, throughout the rest of this talk. And we need to introduce SI prefixes and try and get a perspective on it. So you've likely seen and heard before uh, the kilo, centa, and milli prefixes, which correspond to a thousand, one hundredth, and one thousandth of a meter or whatever unit you're working with. Uh, but the ones that we're going to be talking about more so here are the micro, nano, and pico. And there are a million micrometers in a meter, or 10 to the negative 6 meters per micrometer. There are a billion nanometers in a meter, and there are a trillion picometers in a meter. Now, these seem very abstract, and you likely can't uh, easily conceptualize what a trillion picometers looks like into a meter. So let's try and compare it to something a bit more tangible to us using uh, time scales. So 1,000 seconds corresponds to just shy of 17 minutes. A 1,000-fold increase going up to a million seconds corresponds to about 11.6 days. So you can see we've already gone from minutes to days in that uh, jump. Going up to a billion seconds, we're now at 31.7 years. If we go even further to a trillion seconds, that would correspond to about 317.1 centuries. So you can see it's a huge difference between these orders of 10 to the third as we get smaller and smaller in this regime. And just to sort of conceptualize that to things you may have seen in everyday life or under a microscope, uh, the head of a pin is about one millimeter in diameter. This corresponds to a million nanometers. Uh, likewise, ragweed pollen is about 20 microns in diameter, or 20,000 nanometers. You can also see red blood cells, which are about 2.5 microns, or 2,500 nanometers. And then as we get into the realm of nanotechnology, which is things we really care about down on this scale, uh, things such as the carbon nanotube are about 2 nanometers in diameter. And this is sort of a scale bar in nanometers, giving you a comparison of different small things to very large things. So a glucose molecule is about a nanometer in diameter, roughly speaking. If we compare that to a virus, that's about 100 nanometers in diameter. Then you go all the way up to a tennis ball, which is just shy of about a billion nanometers, if you will. And this is just another way of visualizing that scale. And this really helps show where we are limited by resolution with our eyes. So you can see, we can see down to about a human embryo or egg, if you will, with our eyes. And you can't really resolve it very well, but you could visualize it. If you want to get smaller down to the cellular level, or seeing things such as bacteria and mitochondria, we need to rely on what are called light microscopes using visible light. And at a certain point, we're going to be limited by the resolution of visible light. And we're going to have to use what are then called electron microscopes or going further, scanning probe microscopes to really visualize these very, very small features. And to really understand why a light microscope falls off at a certain point and we can no longer use it, we need to understand that we are surrounded by waves or the electromagnetic spectrum. It is ubiquitous and it's all around us in everyday life. And the visible spectrum here that we can actually see is an incredibly narrow range of about 350 nanometers. There are tons of other forms of electromagnetic radiation that you have likely seen and heard of before. Most all of us have quite likely cooked with microwaves, which are on the scale of about one hundredth of a meter. Uh, many of us, uh, especially the older folks, have likely listened to the radio, which goes up to the scale of kilometers in terms of wavelength. And we think of these as generally harmless, relatively speaking, to humans. And then you maybe also know of these more damaging forms of electromagnetic radiation, such as ultraviolet light from the sun and x-rays, which we use for bone and dental imaging, where you have to put on a lead plate to minimize exposure. And it's interesting that as we get smaller and smaller in wavelength, we have a higher frequency. And this is going to correspond to the higher energy that can ionize and damage skin. So let's try and dissect that a bit further and really dig into what's happening there. To dissect the wave or, the, or any form of electromagnetic radiation, we really only need to look at three components. The first is a frequency component. It's how many times this wave oscillates within a single second. And this is represented typically in hertz or inverse seconds. We then also need to consider the wavelength of our electromagnetic magnetic radiation, which corresponds to a full sinusoidal, sinusoidal oscillation. And the amplitude corresponds to the height of this wave. And as I mentioned on this previous slide, 
uh, all of the, those waves have an inversely proportional relationship to wavelength and frequency. And the only constants we need to really understand what's going on there and the energy of this light is the speed of light and Planck's constant. So the speed of light is about three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And Planck's constant is a very small value of about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. So every form of electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. This is one of the fastest speeds that we know of uh, to man, if you ignore weird quantum entanglement phenomena. So the frequency and wavelength, the product between these two will always correspond to the speed of light because these waves are always propagating outward at that speed. And we can relate that to the energy using this quantum constant, Planck's constant, and note that the energy is directly proportional to the frequency. It is the product of Planck's constant times the frequency. And using the above equation, we can also relate the energy of any given wave to its wavelength here, if we just substitute it in. And we can see that it's inversely proportional to wavelength. And so just as an example problem here, we have a one hertz wave. You can see we have one full sinusoidal oscillation in a second and a five hertz wave where we have five full oscillations in that same time period. And you can use these constants to do the general energy calculations if you'd like. And you can find that indeed the energy of a five hertz wave is a bit higher than that of your one hertz wave. Now there are three fundamental properties of waves that we really need to talk about for the sake of this lecture and understanding how we can take this further and break this optical limit of resolution. The first is that we have a refraction phenomena, which you may have seen before, such as on album covers like Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon. If we shine white light, which contains all of the visible components of light in it, into a medium, such as glass or water, these waves are going to deflect, and they're actually going to bend outward in different angles. And you can separate out all of the visible components of light doing this. We can also, but in visualize what's called a diffraction phenomena. If we take a light wave, such as this one over here, and shine it through a very, very narrow slit, what's going to happen is it's going to diffract outward or continue propagating in three dimensions as it goes through this slit. It doesn't just go straight forward. And you can sort of imagine this, if you can see it, it looks sort of like water ripples in, a, in an ocean. And it's very uh, similar to that same phenomena. And what also happens is if you have two of these slits open, those diffracting waves are now going to interact with each other. And they're going to have regions where they overlap in phase and out of phase. And these are going to correspond to constructive and destructive interference patterns. And it's easier to see in this still image here, if we have a single light source going outward, we then have the waves diffracting outward. And you can see these overlapping regions. And when they overlap in phase, they're going to constructively interfere and create even brighter regions of light. And then the destructive interference corresponds to these periodic black regions here. So these are sort of the three fundamental phenomena and interactions with light that we need to understand for the sake of this uh, talk. And this is really cool because if you find it interesting, you can actually visualize these properties on your own just using a laser pointer and a DVD. Um, I'm not going to give the whole safety spiel here, but if this is something that interests you, please take the time to read an EHS document about laser safety. Improper, la uh, just generally speaking, lasers are very poorly regulated, and you can end up purchasing very high power ones that could permanently damage your eyes. So please be very mindful uh, when purchasing lasers if you want to do something like this. But if you're curious, all you really need is a laser pointer, a DVD, and a pair of scissors to cut it up. And the reason this works is that the DVD's track acts as a diffraction. Uh, many of you may actually not have used CDs or DVDs these days, but if we look at them under a microscope, an atomic force microscope image, we can see what a blank CD and DVD look like. So this is called the track on a disc. This is an unwritten disc, and this just spirals outward from the center. And as you write on the tracks, what happens is you create periodic regions where they're no longer just a full track. You've got these little holes and breaks in it. And this is then read out by a laser. And this corresponds to your audio or video data. So you can shine that light through, say, this track pitch of about 0.78 microns, and your light is going to diffract through it. 
And this is a really fun thing you can just do at home really easily. So we were talking about limits of resolution in optical microscopes. Well, an optical microscope is ultimately going to be limited by visible light because that's what we are manipulating to visualize our sample of interest. And so the general operating principle is you have a sample illuminated by light. Light is collected at this objective lens here, tries to take a point focused area and take it through a condenser. And then it's inverted through an eyepiece lens here at the end to magnify your image. Now, all we have to work with is the efficiency of our objective and the wavelengths of light that we're working with. And so the resolution R, which we want to be as small as possible, is limited by the wavelength of light we're working with divided by two times NA, which is the numerical aperture. This numerical aperture corresponds to sort of the cone shape of light between your objective lens and your object of interest. And it is the only thing you have control over in an optical microscope. It's the only thing you can manipulate. So even if you had the most perfect numerical aperture in the world, you're still going to be limited in resolution by at best blue light, which is the smallest wavelength of visible light or violet light, I should say. And so the reason this occurs is because now that we know a bit about the interactions of electromagnetic radiation, we need to understand that if we're looking at some sample feature down here from a point source and it's going through our objective lens, well, every feature on this is going to reflect light out of it. And then that light is going to diffract through this objective and you're going to get this point spread function. And you ideally, with perfect resolution, want to get this airy disk where you have almost no intensity whatsoever in these dim regions. So this corresponds to a single feature under your microscope. But as you can imagine, you have multiple features. Your surface is probably covered in different things you're trying to visualize. And if you had a second feature incredibly close to it, you now have two point spread functions that are in incredibly close proximity to each other. And if they're too close, those two peaks eventually are going to overlap and they'll become indistinguishable from each other because they'll constructively interfere and just become a blob, if you will. And so your two features are now unresolvable. They look identical, but just as sort of a blurry region. And so that's what limits us. We're using optical microscopes. There are some really neat uh, sort of tricks you can do using STED and other things with optical light. Uh, but generally speaking, for a, a simple microscope with no other tips, uh, little tricks going on with bells and whistles, this is what's going to limit you. So this is something you can do on your own if you're interested. You can purchase USB microscopes for very cheap online. And it's really cool to see the different features uh, under a lens. This uh, one back here on this slide, these are, this is a cross section of a stem in a plant. And you can see all of the individual cells and some really cool, unique features that just sort of emerge. And you know, this is a real color image. This isn't false colored. So you see all of this is just beautiful features. Uh, and so if you're interested in the world around you and sort of the periodicity of certain objects, I would strongly encourage you to look under a lens and sort of take this up on your own. But as we move forward, we're no longer gonna be able to rely on our eyes as a detector and so what's going to happen is we're going to have to utilize our knowledge of different physical and chemical interactions to help us discern and re resolve very small things. And so just a simple analogy to the UV, uh, optical microscopes is what's called UV vis spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy sorry. And this uh, operates on the general phenomena that anytime you absorb a color, so something that absorbs red, is going to reflect outward as green. So if you're wearing a green shirt, the reason your shirt looks green is because it's absorbing the complementary color to green or red. So you're seeing the absence of red or green as a result. Now we can use the uh, spectrometer to shine white light, just like we did when shining it through a prism, into a sample. And that sample is going to interact or absorb certain wavelengths of light. It's hard to see here, but you can see the yellow line is now absent from our purple cuvette because if you are absorbing uh, yellow light, your reflected color will come out as violet. We can then separate out all of that light through a diffraction grating, or you could use a prism as well. And all of those different wavelengths of light then are sent to a light detector array, which measures the intensity of every nanometer of light from the visible spectrum. 
And you might think, well, that's kind of trivial, right? I could look at this sample and say it's purple. I don't need this detector to give me that information. Uh, but the reality is when you're working with very, very fine, uh, not fine, but closely related colors, you don't have that nanometer resolution with your eyes. So you need to rely on something a bit more uh, accurate and precise, if you will. So if you can believe it, uh, on the right side here, this is, these are all gold solutions, uh, which may seem a little counterintuitive because you don't normally think of gold as being red or purple. And what's happening here is that these are all nanoparticle solutions of gold. And a very interesting phenomena occurs here called surface plasmon resonance where incident light actually begins to make all of the electrons in the gold nanoparticle oscillate with the incident frequency. And you see these resulting colors as a result. And you can use this as a very powerful tool for what's called colorimetric analysis. So these are gold nanoparticles in the presence of a pollutant. And that pollutant makes them aggregate and get clumped together more and more. And you can empirically fit this and you can get very valuable information such as the concentration of a contaminant just based on the color of your nanoparticle solution aggregation and a UV vis spectrometer. And just as a brief aside, since we also talk about art a lot in these discussions, gold nanoparticles have a huge history in being used as a, a means of coloring stained glass. So if you ever entered an old church or some other old feet of architecture with these beautiful, vibrant red colors, it's quite likely that they use gold nanoparticles as a means to get that very beautiful dye. And this is awesome because there's a really cool place called Public Labs that uh, makes their own paper craft and Lego-based spectrometers. So if you find this topic interesting, you can for 10 to $25 build your own out of paper or Legos using nothing more than just a generic webcam or your cell phone camera, a DVD fragment, and just the materials they send you. So what if we have, uh, what if we tried doing our same experiments with a double slit, but using electrons? Hopefully this will play, there we go. So if we shot electrons through a double slit experiment, we would anticipate that it would just go straight through because it's a particle, right? It shouldn't do anything but go straight through the slit towards the detector. But what occurs is it doesn't go straight through. You can see it sort of goes outward in all directions. This sort of suggests maybe they're diffracting through the slits. And as the electrons continue to build up uh, at the detector here, as you can see as it speeds up, periodic bright and dark regions actually begin to emerge. This is very puzzling and interesting at the same time because this seems to suggest that electrons, something that we have traditionally and classically thought of as just being a physical particle, actually exhibit wave-like properties. They appear to be diffracting and interfering with themselves, which is very bizarre and also seemingly unintuitive. And we're going to utilize this phenomenon in, uh, for ultimately increasing our resolution going forward. So that is the wave-particle duality. Uh, as mentioned before, small particles like electrons can exhibit these wave-like properties. This follows what's called the de Broglie wave equation. And it's only dependent on the mass and velocity of the particle. And what's most fascinating about this is that the largest molecule that has demonstrated this duality contains up to 2,000 atoms. And it's important to bear in mind that each of these 2,000 atoms has its own set of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So we're talking about quite well over probably 10,000 particles in tandem capable of acting as a wave in a double slit experiment, which is just mind-numbing to me. And as mentioned before, it's just the de Broglie wave equation. It's just Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity of your particle. You can try and do this calculation for a baseball thrown at the fastest speed by a pitcher, for example, if you'd like, and you'll see why you can't really see that wave particle duality for macro scale objects. And you might be curious, uh, since we mentioned that electrons can act as waves, you might be saying, well, can waves also then act as particles? The answer is yes. Uh, and this is a phenomenon called the photoelectric effect. 
in which packets of light or particles of light called photons can strike a metal surface. And if they're high enough in energy, they'll eject out electrons with a kinetic energy or a scattering effect. We're not going to talk too much about this, but just in case that's something that you are curious about, they, it is in fact a wave particle duality in both directions. So now that we know an electron can act as a wave, what if we try using that electron as a wave in the same way we did with an optical microscope, where we simply show light down on a sample, but now we're going to shine electrons down on that sample, because we can get the electrons to a lower wavelength of light than that of visible light. So it's the same general operating principle as an uh, optical microscope. This here is one of two electron types of microscopes. This is a transmission electron microscope. I'll briefly discuss the differences between the two in a moment. Uh, but this is going to have some caveats. Uh, you can't just shoot an electron right going forward and have it hit a sample. The reality is it's a very reactive thing that's going to collide and interact with just about any gaseous molecule it could. So this requires a vacuum system of pretty high vacuum to avoid your electrons with colliding uh, any, with any contaminants in your chamber. You really needed to actually make it to your sample unobstructed. And it uses extremely high voltages between 10 and 300 keV. The reason for this is, is if you remember on the previous slide, the de Broglie wave equation was dependent on the mass times the velocity of the particle. This voltage is the accelerating voltage that drives that part of uh, electron in this case forward in an incredibly high velocity. So in order to tune the wavelength of your electron, you need to change its velocity because its mass is pretty much fixed for our uh, systems here. So the wave scales of these electrons can actually reach the lower picometer scale, which is relative to the scale of atomic radii. Uh, you can ultimately achieve atomic resolution and do what's called electron tomography with electron microscopes. So you can see uh, atomic scales with these. It's just a bit more uh, nuanced than the scanning probe ones that we'll be discussing briefly. Uh, so it can achieve atomic resolution, but it's primarily in two-dimensional materials, and you'll see why it's limited there. So when we shoot an electron beam through a sample, there are a ton of different physical ways that that electron beam can actually interact with what's your sample. There are only three that we're really gonna focus on here today. The first is secondary electrons, which will give you sort of topographical information. Uh, and then the TEM, the transmission electron microscope, the electrons are actually going all the way through your sample or transmitting through it. And this is where you can get that 2D information and you also get internal structural information about the species you're emitting. So you could see the inside of a cell without having to slice it. And you also get an elastic scattering phenomena, which we'll briefly talk about uh, as a diffraction technique. So the two major forms of electron microscopes that you're going to see are scanning electron microscopes. These are much more user friendly. They survey the surface and score, uh, record scattered electrons. So you're just shooting an electron beam over a surface, electrons scatter everywhere, and you have detectors that pick up the density of states of electrons scattering in different regions. And this gives you a topographical map down sort of on the micron or upper nanometer scale of the materials that you're looking at. Uh, transmission electron microscopes, on the other hand, as I mentioned, the electrons go all the way through the sample, so you can see the internal structures of anything you're interested in, and you can ultimately achieve atomic resolution here. Uh, and the really cool thing about this is that you can visualize this just like you could with an optical microscope. You can see the electron beam striking a phosphorescent screen, so you can actually use that to align it and tune your microscope. Uh, but I'm not going to talk much about it here. Uh, the nuance with transmission electron microscopes is that sample prep is a major uh, feature here. You have very small sample volumes, and you have to treat the sample appropriately to actually get these very high resolution images. So it's not as easy as an optical microscope where you just take your slide, plop it under, and look at it. There's a lot more steps to it, but you can get a lot of very valuable and powerful information as a result. So these are some representative uh, TEM and SEM images of different materials uh, from Rocky Mountain Laboratories and Zeiss. You can see here the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus, as we've been calling it, emerging from patient cells 
So this is the virus here in yellow and the patient cell line in sort of this blue purple gradient. You can also see tuberculosis causing bacteria, which just sort of look like these little worms under a microscope on some sort of background substrate. And a really cool image of the Ebola virus shedding itself from an infected cell. Now, you'll notice all of these images have been colorized and all of these images down here are in black and white. Now, this is a false color image. These cells, are, or the COVID-19 virus doesn't actually look like a yellow dot on some patient's cells that look blue and purple. This is just done as a means of contrasting the region of interest over the background. This is much more prevalent in the field of biology because you normally need to clearly distinguish what these cells are versus the background they're on. This sort of becomes irrelevant uh, when you're working with raw materials because most metals and all of that look almost identical. And so you need to rely on elemental analysis to actually use false color maps to differentiate these. But these are some inorganic materials here as well. You can see this is just a cross section of PCB or printed circuit board. Almost just looks like a stack of logs. Uh, fractured ceramic, which you might argue has no real merit to imaging, but looks very beautiful under a microscope. You can see these different sort of fracture patterns done at a very small scale. And then you can do very interesting manipulations with different materials, and you can create things such as a folding 2D nanoparticle super lattice. And so each one of these little dots here corresponds to a metallic nanoparticle. And through some manipulation under a TEM, they were able to get them to fold in this very beautiful pattern. So another amazing thing we can use electron microscopes for is what's called a diffraction technique. And this can give you crystallographic information about your material. So you've probably seen in daily life things such as large uh, chunks of salt or quartz, and they have these very fine, smooth surfaces. And the reason is that they have a very well-defined repeating structure that continues onward in space. And you can see this at both the macro and micro and even nano scale. Now, what if we imagine that each bond formed in this sodium chloride crystal, for example, is a slit for diffraction. So we have this three-dimensional cube and every bond between the two ions is capable of acting as a slit. Well, it's a highly ordered structure, so we know for a fact that the electron should go through them in a very periodic manner. You know, the diffraction pattern should be predictable based on the unique crystal lattice structure. And so in this case, electrons will be driven in three dimensions through these slits in an orderly and predictable manner. You can think of it as like shooting a, a ping pong ball, if you will, going bouncing off of all this stuff. And you can discern different crystallographic information, even in very complex structures that have polycrystalline areas to it. So this is just sort of a representative image uh, from a simulation of a different sample here and the diffraction pattern that you see as a result. And based on this information, you can determine if this is diffracting in say the 111 or 100 plane of any given material. This is very valuable, more so at the material scale. Biologists probably don't use this as much, but it gives you a ton of valuable information about a sample that you might not otherwise normally have. So we've talked about a lot of different techniques that have been sort of using uh, electromagnetic radiation and manipulating it or utilizing wave particle duality to get down to that level of resolution. What if we really want to consistently image atoms and get topographic maps at that scale, reliably and reproducibly, uh, without doing a ton of overly complex sample prep? Well, we can do what you can sort of think of as braille with atoms, where we take a physical tip and we scan it along the surface, just like you would if you were reading uh, something in braille. And there are two fundamental sort of scanning probe microscopy techniques that we employ. And this is what we do a lot of work with in our lab, as Jim had briefly mentioned. The first is a scanning tunneling microscope. This uh, requires a conductive sample and tip, unfortunately, so you are a little limited in what you can work with. But if this tip and this sample come in incredibly close proximity to each other, say on the order of angstroms or maybe a nanometer apart, and we apply a bias or voltage between the two, 
a quantum phenomena occurs and electrons can actually tunnel from this tip to the sample or vice versa through this insulating medium, which it shouldn't normally be able to traverse. This is pretty fascinating because if we can figure out a uh, tunneling current, as we call it, for the electrons bouncing from the tip to the sample, we can hold this tunneling current constant and we can drag this tip across the sample back and forth, back and forth. And as it approaches a feature, that tunneling current is gonna spike. And so the tip can pull upwards. It's gonna recognize its approach to something such as a hill, and it'll scan over that hill while trying to maintain a constant current. And this is something you can't visually see, right? You can't see the atoms or this tip really scanning over a surface down on a nanometer scale. So we simply have to rely on our knowledge of the interactions between the two. We have to understand this tunneling phenomena and how it occurs. And then if we can measure that and record it as it scans across the surface, we can create a topographical image based on the current mapping. You can do a very similar phenomena with what's called atomic force microscopy. This is a little different in that this now has a physical tip, which may actually be in contact with the sample. It doesn't have to be. There are a couple different modes, and I can go into depth on them. But uh, you can imagine that if we scrape this tip across the sample, it's going to deflect. It's going to feel some force and deflection based on the features that it's scanning across. And that deflection at a cantilever is then shot. I'm uh, sorry, let me rephrase this. You're shining a laser down on a cantilever, and based on the deflections of that cantilever, it's going to shoot that laser out into a four quadrant photo detector, and these deflections correspond to a topographical map as well. So these are two very powerful tools you can use to simply scan a probe across the surface, and using your knowledge of the physical interactions between the probe and the substrate itself, you can discern topographical information about it. You can also get a ton of other really cool information about it by modifying these tips as well. Uh, you can get thermal information as well as electrical conductivity information in uh, AFM. You get very interesting electrical information in what's called scanning tunneling spectroscopy as well. So very powerful techniques. These are some awesome images. You can see that really show you just how deep into it you can get. This is an STM image of a gold one one I'm sorry one zero zero surface. Uh, it's a surface reconstruction, so you can sort of see all of these little circular regions here correspond to individual gold atoms. Likewise, we have the STM of a carbon nanotube here, so we're now looking at carbon carbon bonds. Uh, this is a really nice image as well of pentacene, which is just this molecule up here on nickel one one one. So. It's not the most zoomed in or highest resolved, if you will, but you can see these pentacene molecules present and how they sort of are just uh, chaotically organized on the surface. AFM images generally aren't as great at getting atomic resolution, but you can still get very valuable information out of them. This is the AFM image of Mimi virus fibers. You can sort of see this is down at a 100 nanometer scale, so we're still in a very tiny, tiny regime. This is the uh, first AFM image from Mars. This was a fascinating, fascinating thing they did. Uh, the Phoenix rover mission has its own atomic force microscope built into it. And this is just a calibration grid. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just a grid that they know has these very well-defined uh, little pitches in them. And this rover has to use this grid to calibrate itself on Mars. It can't calibrate on Earth and then be sent out to a foreign atmosphere. So they need to use a test grid like this to actually ensure that their instrument is operating properly on a foreign planet. And we have uh, recently gotten the first atomic force microscope images of Martian dust. This is another atomic force image of carbon nanotubes. So you can see this is much more zoomed out now uh, than this carbon nanotube here, but you can sort of see how they're laid down on the surface. And so these are two very powerful techniques for imaging things down at the atomic scale and are very uh, frequently used both in the fields of uh, I guess inorganic, and inorganic materials and biological imaging. Now, you're highly limited by the tip that you're working with in these systems. As I mentioned before, you can't really visualize these interactions. You're simply uh, utilizing your knowledge of how they work together and in unison. And so 
if we look on the bottom here, this is sort of an example of a perfect STM tip scanning back and forth across a buckyball sample here. And it won't really have any major defects because it's supposed to be an atomically precise tip, which you can see sort of in an image here. This is an AFM image now, but it's an atomically precise tip. And if it goes over a test grid here, you can see these finely resolved points corresponding to the sample you're imaging. But if we have defects in the tip, such as sort of a weird double tip phenomena here, or the tip is flat and blunt, what's going to happen is your features are now finer in resolution than your tip. And so you're going to see artifacts as a result. You're no longer imaging these fine points on your sample. Your sample is actually imaging the defects on your tip. You can see the double tip emerge in this test grid here as a result of this fraction at the tip, uh, at the apex of the AFM tip here. And so this is an incredibly important phenomenon to be conscious of. I mentioned electron microscopy is very nuanced. But the same holds true with scanning probe microscopy. You have to be very conscious of all the different variables at play here. Uh, just because, again, you're really relying on physical and chemical interactions. You're not able to directly visualize these things. You need to rely on those interactions and how they're fed into a detector to truly get this level of resolution. And it's not the most fancy thing in the world, but <clears throat> if you want to sort of get a visualization of the limits of resolution on a scanning probe microscope, you can take a perforated sheet of paper, something such as a napkin or paper towel, and you can try and imagine all of those divots or high areas corresponding to an atom or a molecule of interest. And if you try to scan over it with a pen, a pencil, and a marker, something very wide as a brush, you'll see that it's going to cover over multiple atoms. And so just as you had that same phenomena in an optical microscope where your point spread functions overlap, at a certain point, if your tip is scanning over, say, six different atoms at once, you're no longer able to resolve them. They become irresolvable, and you're just looking at a blur or sort of a conglomeration of all of these different materials coming together. And so it's important to be cognizant of all of these sort of parameters going forward when you're trying to do this level of imaging, uh, just because otherwise you'll run into errors such as these artifacts here, and it will seem sort of inexplicable and without the proper knowledge of how a tip defect could give you this information, you might misinterpret this as real data. If this wasn't a test grid, you might expect this, or might, you might not know what to expect, and so you may mistake this to be something real. So it's very important to be familiar with the nuances to all these microscopes and trying to use them. Uh, but yeah, that's just sort of a quick and dirty overview of scanning uh, just increasing limits of resolution and different imaging techniques. I hope it's been somewhat informative. And if you have any questions about doing these workshops, please feel free to contact me via email as you see fit. Uh, and with that, since I finished a little early, I think we do have time to field some questions if there are any. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.